Aloha from Maui, everyone. How are you? Oh, I thought we did it. I have to see you. Great to see everyone. I always like to read something just to kind of set a theme, even though we're kind of talking about, uh, well, kind of, we're actually talking about etiquette uh, from. Curtis Sensei's Ki Aikido on Maui Training Manual. I dug this out of my library. I think it was written in one of John Stevens' books, but it is O Sensei's Etiquette for Practicing Aikido. So it's not very long. Let me read it here real quick. In Aikido, one blow can determine life, life or death. When practicing, obey your instructor and do not engage in useless contests of strength. Aikido is an art in which persons learn to deal with one with not only one, but multiple attackers. If there, it therefore requires that you practice at all times with careful awareness, not only in front of you, but in all directions. Practice at all times with a feeling of pleasurable exhilaration. The teachings of your instructor constitute only a small fraction of what you will learn. Your mastery of each movement will depend almost entirely on an individual earnest practice. The purpose of Aikido is to train both body and mind and to develop a person's sincerity. Aikido techniques are secret in nature and are not to be idly revealed to others in public, not shown to rowdy or unprincipled people who will misuse them. So it doesn't have a date of when that was written, but it's dated. You can, you can, you can uh, hear it in the text uh, that uh, it's, uh, you know, don't share Aikido, that kind of thing. And that just goes to be goes to where O Sensei came from. You know, uh, anytime you're you're analyzing any kind of text or phrase, uh, especially when it comes to translation, uh, you have to look at several things when it was written, you know, not only who wrote it, but when it was written. You know, uh, Toy, you know, O Sensei was born in the 1800s, Toy Sensei was born in 1920, uh, Suzuki Sensei 1917, Curtis Sensei 1944, you know, and, and, and on and on, as you can see, you know, any, any person, any teaching, you know, any teacher is going to be bringing, bringing out their own style and, and what they were exposed to. Uh, so that being said, let's go back to the book. Yeah, uh, we left off at number 18, uh, number 18 on page four. Uh, the sensei usually stands at or near the front of the dojo watching while the students practice. When acting as an assistant to the sensei, a student should never stand with their, his or her back to the sensei facing towards the students. If an assigned instructor or assistant instructor you wish for some reason to cease teaching a certain class, you must report directly to the head instructor. For example, if you are an assistant instructor and wish to resign your position, it is not enough merely to inform the instructor of that class. That was number 19. And number 20, for all assigned instructors attending all key Q and DOM tests, children and adults, it is essential part of your teaching responsibility. This gives moral support for the students and allows you an overview that you might otherwise miss. So those three bring up a, a, a very interesting point, and, and that is as teaching. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to call on some people, uh, instructors, to, to ask you some questions uh, because you know this in Maui we have uh, we have a pretty structured teaching program. And this is on Maui, and, and your do all dojos are different, but on Maui, you know, uh, basically uh, we have a lot of classes, actually a class seven days a week when we are training at the dojo, and we have a variety of instructors. We, you know, we have instructors for children, which is headed by Lynn Curtis Sensei. We have an instructor for teens, which is headed by Molly Stokesbury uh, and Joni Jackson Sensei, and then we have a beginners. Uh, class, which is myself and Fincher Sterling Sensei, and then we have uh, Curtis Sensei, which oversees us, and then we have the two advanced teachers, myself and Jeff Baldwin Sensei, who uh, teach the advanced Aikido classes, and then Curtis Sensei, of course, still teaches key class and weapons class, as well as Masogi. So with that being said, not only do we have those people teaching at the dojo, 
usually what sensei wants to do is he wants to develop other people uh, so he will ask usually someone around shodan nidan sandan level to assist in some of those classes and i have had you know since i've been teaching the beginners class for you know over 10 years now i've had probably four or five assistant instructors and it's it's in fact john hara is my current assistant instructor and and it's really interesting to see instructors develop and i didn't have the advantage of a structured program you know i remember the first class i taught in aikido i was fourth cue not even qualified to teach anything but i happened to be at the dojo in arizona and follower sensei called up and said i'm sick who's there and i went i am sensei <laughs> he goes who else and i go uh no one else <laughs> great you're teaching i was like okay and nobody higher rank than me showed up that night so i was on the i was on the mat as a teacher that day um and you know and then at third q i was assigned to teach a beginner's class in arizona again third q not even qualified really to be teaching anything but you know as they say in key in daily life you know teach what you've, you've been taught in the past and that's basically what i did and you know in the last uh, friday's class you know curtis sensei mentioned this in his class was when he was teaching uh, uh when suzuki sensei asked him to teach the advanced class he he was teaching exactly what suzuki sensei was taught taught on wednesday and larry shishido sensei one time you know he you heard the story took him off to the side and said you know when, when are you gonna teach your class so that was great but i want to hear what you have to say and i've often said every teacher has to find their own voice uh basically i don't teach anything really like curtis sensei or suzuki sensei um but i've learned a lot from them and i've incorporated some of their things into my teaching um and you know there are people who are naturally gifted at teaching and then there are others that really have to you know just like aikido they're naturally gifted aikido students and then there are people that really have to work hard at it and you have to know for yourself you know hey am i a person that that is naturally gifted if that's the case then you really need to work harder because sometimes you like to rest on your laurels you know and if you're not you you have to really work at it and and discover your voice uh you know this by no means uh am i uh, am i trying to say you have to follow the rules you know that we set out here on maui you know being from another area but i think what's important and and I and i say this is is how do you transmit your teaching to your students you know it's it just on the mat is it off the mat are you, are you are you doing you know meeting with your students what 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 are you doing to bring them along and uh i don't know if you've heard this or not but uh, i've heard it from curtis sensei and and when you know curtis sensei talks about you know suzuki sensei selecting him to be his auditory meaning the next guy the 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 guy that comes up next when he appointed him that responsibility which is an immense of responsibility the first thing out of suzuki sensei was not congratulations or i know you can do it was okay so who's going to succeed you that was his question to him and and, and curtis sensei said well i don't know he said no i want you to decide right now who's going to succeed you and and of course he brought up a name and it, it doesn't matter who that person is because what the whole purpose of that was not for curtis sensei to to decide on the spot who who was going to succeed him it was basically you need to start thinking about it now meaning you got to start preparing students to fulfill your position someday and and the thing of it is is there are a lot of students and a lot of times you know there's not enough teachers or you may not have enough classes you know and at some dojos you may have three classes a week 
And of course, you know, giving up a spot to somebody is a big deal because you only have three nights a week. But that's important uh, to develop people. And, to, you know, at, at my company, you know, I always tell the managers, hey, who, who are you training to be your successor? You know, who's going to take your job? You know, you got to think about it and you got to start preparing for someone. And so I'm going to ask Toby Vogel Sensei, what kind of succession plan do you have for Europe? What kind of teacher training do you have? Have you started thinking about it? Well, poor, difficult question. But, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 also because the uh, system is a little bit different. We have, uh, uh, the government has a, a federation that kind of says, uh, um, how you say that? Allows for official teachers. So you, if, if you, if you uh, do a teacher program with the government, they will give you a, a certificate for that. You're acknowledged as a teacher. So what we do is we, um, our main teachers, we go, uh, let them go to this, through this program also. Um, we have uh, uh, different teachers for some of, uh, some of the days. So we don't have different, uh, like a beginner's class or advanced class. We just have regular classes, but uh, they will be taught by different teachers. In case of succession, in our case, it was easy. My father started and I took over. Now it becomes more difficult. So we have to find the correct person. I don't know. We are, uh, the, our, our history is too young. We are too young at Dojo to, to be able to you know, see a pattern in that or to have a, a certain pattern for that. We're, we're just going along as, as things develop and see what, what happens. That's actually all there. Yeah, there's, uh, unless you want to know more, Sensei, I, I, that's, that's all I have to say to that. It's, it's a doyo with too, uh, too short a history. Sure, sure. But did Curtis Sensei ask you this question when he nominated you as the chief instructor? Uh, no, no. Did not. Okay. No. I, I didn't know either way, but I'm sure he wants you to think about it. I'm confident of that. So, and, and you're in a very interesting predicament where you are. I mean, there's a lot of other teachers. I mean, you're the, you're the main guy in Holland, but you're chief instructor of, of the Europe Key Federation. And there are other instructors in, in, in Europe as well. How, how is that? How does that play out for you? Same in the same way. It's still uh, very early. It's a young young federation, right? We're still uh, looking for a, 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 um, to see how to structure that, or if we want to structure that, and how to do that. And, and but of course, in in this in this case of who will be the next chief instructor of Europe and so on, and how will it develop in the future? That is on my mind. Uh, yeah, always, always on my mind because. Uh, we want to have a foundation that is strong enough so that we can also in Europe have a, a, a long history of Ki Aikido. And because of all the changes in the past, we're still a very young federation, a young, you know, uh, only a few dojos in, in the federation, but it will grow, but then it ha needs to grow further. So the, the, the basics of that is on the mind or on our minds always. Yeah. But still too young to, yeah. Yeah, but a lot of young people are in the in the federation, so there are a lot of uh, possibilities. There's sure. a lot of options. <laughs> sure. And because of the different countries, there's a lot of options. So it's it's all open at this point. And can I ask a question? You you know the it's a very interesting uh, system you have in Europe that you have to be officially licensed to be to be uh, an instructor. So when you select, do you have a selection process at your dojo for selecting people to go through the course? Uh, no, we, uh, well, this is, uh, not every country uh, requires that, not even in Holland it's required, but it's like you can start a dojo in the garage and that's fine, right? But in, in, in the system provides for some backup, so insurance and so on. 
Uh, I, I believe in Italy they have the same system, so they, they need to go to a certain program or to be officially recognized by the government as a teacher. Um, what we did is, uh, at, when you are at a point that you could actually start teaching classes, we'll ask you if you want to do that for us, right? And uh, if you want to do that, because what are your ambitions in, in Kiaikido? What do, would you like to do? And um, so the, um, and, and then we, we will, you know, uh, run them to the program. We will tell them, okay, please then go and do the program. But it's not you know, officially required in, in Holland, but it, in, in the sense that you, you could start any, any, anyone could start a dojo or a shop in his garage, that's fine, but you need to you know, have some recognition. Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. And when somebody's up for teaching, we'll tell them, okay, what would you like to do? What are your ambitions in Aikido? What are your ambitions in life? What, you know, would this fit you? Uh, if not, then don't do it. If, if, if so, please go and do the program. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And, and, you know, in, you know, Maui's very uh, uh, bit different than the mainland. In the mainland, it's a bit different because, of course, this whole, you know, Hawaii Key Federation was, you know, when, when uh, Toy Sensei asked him to start up the Hawaii Key Federation again, um, it's because, you know, there really wasn't a system on the mainland. There wasn't, you know, Shader Sensei is the chief instructor of the Eastern Key Federation, but that's a really new organization. That, that's not as, that's, that came later after Hawaii. And, and the same thing, the Midland Key Federation was there, but, you know, it really wasn't organized. Each, when I came on board in, in 95, each, you know, there, there basically was, I don't know, five, six, seven chief instructors that Toy Sensei had named. And, you know, there was a big group of chief instructors from Hawaii. Uh, and there was humongous competition and infighting among the groups you know the group in hawaii couldn't get along suzuki sensei couldn't get along with with uh tabata sensei and uh tabata sensei couldn't get along with nonaka sensei and it was just it was it was really just horrible you know if you look back on it you know here we are we're you're practicing you know uh harmony and and connection and it was not that at all so much so that Toy Sensei came in and basically said, you guys are done, you know, <laughs> breaking up the Federation. And it was a real trying time uh, in Aikido. And Curtis Sensei, you know, being selected to bring it all together, it was one of the, probably one of the hardest things he's ever done. I've never asked him, but I'm sure it was because of all the history. You know, you have to understand, you know, I said this, I think, in the first or second uh, uh, YouTube, uh, Zoom class we did, you know, when Suzuki, in 1953, when Suzuki Sensei got handed uh, Toy Sensei's black belt and said, okay, you're the guy, um, he was like, okay, and then three months later, they're arguing about how to do a technique on the mat because people, you know, were so new at it. So anytime a new organization comes bar apart it can it can it comes up it can it can be divided very quickly with competition and people thinking they're it or they're the guy and that you know anytime you you get four people in a room you're going to get differences opinion you know and you got to be super careful of of that you know especially when instructors you know, oh, this is, you know, uh, from example, when I started Aikido at, uh, in Arizona, I started at a community college, and my very first teacher was a Yandan, Philip Nagasao. He's, he was, a, I think, a Sansei of J Japanese. His parents, his grandparents had immigrated from Japan, and he was doing Aikido to link to his Japanese heritage in, in Arizona. And he came about because the, the person that had, had uh, opened the Key Society Dojo there 
had passed away, had died. And Fowler Sensei had moved there from Mexico City because he was a DEA officer and he had opened a dojo and Nagasawa Sensei linked up with him. So they didn't, they came from two different groups, you know, both key society, but two different groups. Uh, and Fowler Sensei had learned in New York City, New York City under, under uh, Yamada. And he had a different perspective and they didn't get along, but I didn't know this. All I know is I'm a new guy in Aikido and we're learning a technique, but in order to take a test, we had to go to the main dojo. And when we go to the main dojo, we start seeing the techniques and we see, oh, wow, these are, these are a little different than, than what we're practicing at the college. And a lot of the reasons why is because the people at the dojo were much older. They weren't as young as the people at the college. So there was a little bit, they're a little bit more invigorating, let's say. And we come back to class after, after seeing how they did stuff at the dojo and, and the Nagasawa goes, so you have a choice. You can do it my way or you can do it the dojo way. And we were like, oh, sensei, we want to do it your way. But of course that was super insulting to follow sensei who was the main guy. And, and we were, too naive and we were too young to know any different about it and it was it was it, it created a really bad skiff at the dojo just between members i mean it was horrible and i see this play i used to see this play out at various dojos in the united states in the mainland you know and and even you know here in hawaii it existed so i know in Europe, it's not any different. I'm, I'm almost positive that it's probably very similar to, oh, there's this way to do it, there's that way to do it. And that is just so below what we need to be thinking about. You know, uh, it's, it's, you know, when I read that very first one back to the book, you know, you know, don't stand in front of the class. And I, I've had assistants who I'll, I'll call up and I'll, say, I'll give them a little, you know, hey, you know, watch that student over there. Can you watch them? And they'll stay up front. They'll linger up front with me. But clearly in the etiquette, it says they need to go back in the back. And I, I've assisted for Curtis Sensei for quite some time, and I never go up front. I mean, sometimes I'll go up front, I'll talk to him, but I immediately go to the back of the dojo. I never, if he comes to my side, if I'm on the one side of the dojo and he comes over there, I immediately go to the other side because I don't want to have anybody ask me something rather than him. I don't want to be in that spotlight at all because at the dojo, a lot of people will look at me because I'm less I'm a little bit easier <laughs> to talk to sometimes, or they're afraid to talk to Curtis and say about it. They'll go, oh, Tracy, what are we doing here? I'll be like, dude, that's the sensei, not me. You know, even though I'm there to assist, if he's busy, I'll assist. But if he's not busy, you need to ask him. Always, you know, pointing in that direction because there's, I just don't want to be caught in that, in that aspect at all. You know, I, my techniques are very different than probably Curtis Sensei does them. And I know for a fact, different than Suzuki Sensei. And I remember saying this, you know, after a Taigi competition one year and we were down and we were having some drinks downstairs and, and Suzuki Sensei, he looked over at Fincher and Chris who had, who had won the competition and said, fellas, you did something I could never do. And I was just looking at Suzuki Sensei going, oh yeah. That's right. Suzuki Sensei never did a Taiki competition, never did a Taiki in his life because that isn't what they were taught back then. That wasn't a concentration at all. He did techniques and he was very good at them. But the whole reason, you know, uh, Toy Sensei created the Taikis was because students didn't know what to do at demonstrations. They weren't as creative as he was, you know. I remember talking to an Aikikai teacher, uh, Robert Nadu. He's a very famous teacher up in Northern California. I went to a seminar, or I went to a class of his in San Francisco, and <clears throat> he was telling a story. And and he was he lived in Japan for quite some time, and he would he would hang you know back before 1974, you know, Toy Sensei was a Shihan Bucho, the head guy of the Aikikai. He was always doing demonstrations, and. You know, Nadu Sensei was 
asked to take a zuccay at a demonstration. So we're in the, you know, Troy Sensei never drove, sat in the back seat. The Tomo's driving him to the demonstration. And I'm there and the dude's very nervous because he never been asked to do UK at a demo before. So looks over at Toy Sensei and goes, so uh, Sensei, uh, what are you planning on doing? You know, what are you gonna do? Can you give me a hint so I'm prepared? Toy Sensei looked over and said, no, I don't know. Maybe we'll do some of this. Maybe we'll do some of that. It really doesn't matter. And that's how the demonstration went. It was complete and utter freestyle of him just naturally doing with what the attack came with. And, you know, the, dem the demonstration was very well represented. And the Du Sensei after that realized, oh, yeah, that's what Aikido is. It's, it's about being spontaneous. It's not about planning things out. You know, Toy Sensei had enough experience that this came naturally to him. And he gave us, you know, uh, uh, the Taigis as a method to help us be spontaneous. But people tend to take that as something else when it's really not. And that just brings up a lot of stories, but I want to stick to the, to the you know, teacher development and and maybe uh charles boyer sensei can comment on do you have a teacher development program at lokahi and and what is your experience with that oh thank you sensei well so uh, i suppose you could say i started i started pretty early as well maybe not as early as you did but i had maybe been training for three years or less with when I started teaching. I, I shared a class with someone else. That person would teach some nights, I would teach some nights. We taught a like an older children's class, like a teenager class uh, in South Carolina. Uh, and um, moved to, to Hawaii and started training at Lokahi and uh, started teaching a class um, a very recently developed class. Um, and then I soon after, it wasn't long after that, that uh, I became a head instructor. And then from there, I started teaching more. Um, but, you know, I, I do think about uh, who will be teaching at the dojo when I'm no longer teaching. Um, and that's a tough one because most of the students that we have are either my age or even older. And so it's a, it's a tough question. Um, I mean, they're very good students, but um, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, younger students. And when we do get younger students, they tend not to stay. Teenagers in 20 something, they, they're busy and they go to college and so forth. So those are the ones we have trouble holding on to. Uh, as far as getting teachers ready to uh, learning how to teach, um, we do have assistance with our children's classes, uh, especially our Saturday morning class, which is tends to be our biggest class. Um, for adult classes, we don't. I uh, have just typically maybe not enough students in class to need an assistant. So. Uh, however, uh, you know, I, I do try and look for people to assign when someone's ready to stop teaching. I want someone to be ready to take over and, and step in their shoes. So in that sense, uh, you know, and regardless of the, you know, the objective here about who's going to take over the, the dojo when I'm no longer able to teach, uh, I, 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 my own philosophy about it is that uh, you learn a lot from teaching. It's a very important part of our development in Aikido. And so it's very helpful for all of us to at some point go through this experience. I've learned a lot myself from teaching Aikido. You learn to be open. At first, you're kind of tentative and you might tend to hide your your 
the things you're not so good at. And you can't do that. People pick up on that. And you learn that as you go. I'm also a teacher in work. So I've had a lot of practice with this, uh, this stuff. Um, but in Aikido, it's, a, it's such an important step in our own uh, growth as students. Um, that, I mean, if, you know, I would recommend to anyone, if you have the opportunity to, to, you know, make yourself available to assist and to teach classes because it is, uh, it is just critical to our development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, that's a good, uh, a good point is you learn a lot from just, you know, teaching and, and being able to, to be vulnerable. You know, that's one of the things that Curtis Sensei always would, <laughs> would always preach to me is, so when are you going to be vulnerable? When are you going to be vulnerable? You know, because I like, I'm a planner. I like to plan. I plan my classes when I, I used to write out lesson plans for my classes because that's how I was taught to teach because I learned how to teach from the military. And in the military, it's a very, very structured, you know, on how to, it's from, it, okay, you start off with a review of what you did the day before, and then you go on to what the new lesson plan is, what you're going to go through. And it's, it's really much by the numbers so that anybody can teach in the military. And that's how I approached it when I first started teaching until finally Curtis Sensei said, he just basically said, don't do that anymore. He goes, he goes, you're so much better when you don't do that. You know, so I have very little notes for these Zoom classes, that's for sure. I feel like I'm winging it sometimes because I, I don't have my notes and I don't have my point. Okay, point one, we're doing this. And then, okay, we gotta lead right there to point two or go there. Or, okay, then we'll follow the three. And then basically just write the beginning and the end and everything in the middle is just freestyle. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's just my method. You know, everybody, like I said, finds their own voice and finds how they want to teach. But, you know, the de development of instructors you know, comes from students who have uh, have a vision, maybe, to teach, or a, not necessarily a want. Because person they always says, "Oh, if somebody wants to teach, don't let them teach." You know, because the, usually, you know, and and you'll see this. This happens because you know we're competitive people. You know, uh, I don't know. Okay, I'll tell you a story real quick i was i was i was here on maui i hadn't moved yet it was like 2001 or 2002 there was a seminar going on at the dojo in maui and it was uh, it was the first time curtis sensei had given first time he had given uh a uh, uh, Dan, a show, no, show Q, 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 Joe Q, Joe Q test. He, he was giving a Joe Q test to one of Melly Stokesbury students who was, uh, I believe, second Q, going for first Q, something like that. First time, you know, before that, he had not given any of those tests yet. I distinctly remember this because before the, right after the key test, or it was right after the test, he had tested the key test because he, couldn't show up on a day or whatever, so he's doing it at the seminar. Uh, we, me and my mates that were with me had watched the testing and we're just kind of going, hey, we're totally judging. It was it was horrible. We're judging every person out there on the mat. Eh, yeah, yeah. Eh. And and then of course we're sitting on the side and Curtis Sensei sitting at the table. Right when the testing had ended. He spun around and looked at the three of us who were there and said, I know what you're thinking. And then turned back around. We both looked at each other and went, oh, shit. He knows we're judging them. You know, it was horrible. And, and then he goes out and he gives this, uh, this joke cue test to this student. And the joke cue, that's the, one of the only key tests I've ever seen Curtis and say fail somebody. He failed them. He said, oh, we'll retest you next week. But right now I can't pass you. And I, I don't know what Melly's reaction was. I wish she was here tonight. I'd ask her if she remembers this because I distinctly do. And afterwards, you know, 
in the office, Suzuki Sensei and Curtis Sensei are back there, and Curtis Sensei was just like, ah, oh, man. He hated failing him. He did not want to fail this guy. He goes, this is my fault. I should have prepared this guy better, or, or, or prepared, actually he said, I should have prepared Nelly better so that she could have prepared her student better. And Suzuki Sensei didn't have comment, good or bad about it. You know, one thing about Suzuki Sensei is when he handed the reins over to Curtis Sensei, he did not judge him, comment, give any kind of recommendation to him in front of, he may have privately, but never in front of anybody. He never talked to him about that in front of anybody. That was the, you know, that's the, what Suzuki Sensei did so well. He left himself out of it. When he gave it up, he gave it up and did not judge. Curtis Sensei did not, you know, hey, you should be doing this. You know how he, he I, I, Speak for myself, but I'm sure some of you watch other people teach and go, oh, he should have done that. Or, oh, he missed that right there. I've had people in my own class. And, and mind you, you know, I started teaching in Maui when I was, I think, Sandan. And there were like Godons and Rokudons in my class. So, of course, they'd be like, oh, Trace, you know, that person over there is doing this. I'd be like, thank you so much. But I'm not covering that <laughs> You know, because I was doing a different thing and they were seeing it from a different angle, which we all do. And you have, we have to understand that as instructors, as, as you're going to see something totally different than other people. And that's the one thing about teaching is you have to learn how to see. And of course, at my level, I'm, my perception is always growing and expanding. You know, the classes, I screw cringe you know at the at, I was I gave a couple seminars in Colorado when I was like young Don or something and I cringe now thinking back at how bad they must have been of course they weren't bad but in my perspective now they were horrible you know because I had no business teaching seminars when I was young Don in my opinion of myself right now being very judgmental of myself uh so you know we have to get over that and and you know me uh growing right alongside you is 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 just as important as you know as 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 it is you learning from me i mean it, this is a this is a two-way street here uh, and i think curtis and say makes that very clear and that's why he loves your questions because it is a two-way street it's not just him up there you know I always get reminded of these stories when I start talking like this but when we were Curtis and and I were back in South Carolina we went to the EKF to their Shuge, Shugyo Tase Kigen Chiki seminar and it was I think the very first one that the EKF was going to throw and of course Curtis Sensei was there to give it. I was as a Tomo. And <clears throat> we, uh, you know, Curtis Sensei finishes teaching the whole seminar. It's, it's, it's a very good seminar. And one of the students comes up to Curtis Sensei and Chainer Sensei are talking and said, Oh, Sensei, I have, a, I have something to say. They said, Oh, well, what do you have to say? And I, I don't remember who it was, but I was just standing next to them. And he said, This, this, you guys are, are so diametrically opposed sometimes, you know, Curtis Sensei, or he said, uh, Shainer Sensei, you're like the professor, and Curtis Sensei, you're like the preacher, and, and, and together you guys are like the preacher and the professor, and, and I got a kick out of that, I thought that was quite funny, <laughs> I don't know if Curtis Sensei liked it, but I mean, it was one of those things, I was like, yeah, yeah, because if you know Shainer Sensei, he's a professor. You, you can watch his pot. I mean, he's doing these Zoom classes too, and you can Google EKF and, and watch him, but he teaches it like a university class. I, I'm in the, I, I'm watching going, wow, this is way over my head. They're really getting it on. I'm thinking his students are brilliant. I'm not even up to that standard, you know, when it comes to how they talk about how educated they are. And, and Curtis Sensei, of course, is, is educated. He's, you know, he knows his stuff, but he comes across more, you know, from, from a, uh, he teaches more from his heart, not so much from the, the written down book knowledge, you know, 
uh, and, and, and that's something yeah, you, you have to really like about that. I mean, anybody who teaches from their heart, you know, is giving it their all, you know, but I do want to get back on the subject and, and, and forgive me for going off topic a little, but Udo uh, from Germany, I'd like to get your perspective. You know, you opened a dojo there in Stuttgart and, and uh, after being in Japan for quite some time, well, give us your perspective and your experience. Hi, Sensei. Good morning. Is my mic on? Yes. Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Yes. So at the moment, I'm teaching 14 classes a week and all alone. And uh, the dojo has been, has now, two, we're teaching 12 years now. So the dojo has been there for 12 years. And I am encouraging my students, my adult students, when they have second or first cue, to assist in my children classes. So whenever I feel there's somebody who would like or who I would like to teach or to help, I ask them if I want to help in the children's classes. So that has worked out quite well, so some students are helping me. In my children's classes, I encourage all students above uh, seventh Q to assist in the lower class. So there are some kids who, who have blue belt or yes, seventh Q, yeah. Uh, and they, they raise their hand and say, Sensei, may I? assist in the, in the class, and then if I think they are appropriate, I uh, encourage them to help in the small class. So that has worked out also very well. And also in the, in the new children's, uh, look, uh, in the uh, examination rules that from, from headquarters three years ago, we have all these requirements that children have to be able to to do perform Jun and Taiso and Aiki Taiso at certain levels. So I can take those students in front of the smaller students and perf just perform, have them perform Jun and Taiso or Aiki Taiso at their levels. So that's fun to the students and they, they really notice how they can learn more and how difficult it is to teach and how they have to think about the techniques and the teaching from the other perspective, not from the being taught perspective, but from the teaching perspective. And the third thing is one of my first students, Frederike, which you know in Hawaii, Freddie, she was there. She opened the dojo like, uh, last fall, uh, which is like two hours from here. So, and I'm going there to her once a month and teaching a class so she could look how I teach the class. And after the class, usually we go over the stuff and I uh, tell her why I did this and what else she could add in, in certain positions of the teaching. So that, I think, that's sort of like coaching, really coaching her to be a teacher. She is first time now, and uh, so I'm, I'm sort of building her up to be, yeah, to be able to teach all the classes by herself. So that's about, yeah, maybe, I think, yeah, Tohe Sensei said, you know what, you learn today, you can teach tomorrow, so that's about the model that I'm following. Good. Thank you so much for sharing. Does anyone else have to would like to have add anything? I know Christoph and Linda, you guys don't have your videos on, but I do see you're there. Do you want to add anything? Tell us about your experience, Christoph. You're you're on, but yeah, looks good now. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not sure what you want me to to. To, to, to. Well, you have a dojo in Belgium, is that That's correct? Right. Yeah. 
what's your experience with teaching and and uh, sharing and bringing up teachers? Ha, my dojo is very is very small uh, very small size. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I, I have a, a job that keeps me uh, busy, so I can only teach uh, late in the evening, which means I have to refuse uh, children uh, because I, I, I receive. Uh, uh, phone calls and emails from parents asking me if I can take their kids and I say no look uh, I'm teaching from uh, 8 in the evening till uh, 10 in the evening so uh, uh, that that's not compatible uh, but of course this is a problem because uh, as was uh, explained by Charles Boyer sensei uh, not having uh, uh, young enough people is is, is possibly uh, it's possibly a handicap uh, uh, because then you, are, you, you end up with uh, relatively uh, old adults and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, then, um, so I, I have a, a, a very small size dojo. Uh, I, I, um, I like to uh, to maintain contacts with, uh, with with different dojos in Europe and, and travel when I can. Uh, so I can uh, maintain some diversity in my um, in my approach, in my uh, perception uh, to things, um, and I have my own history in 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 in, in, in uh, stepping into Aikido and coming to Aikido. Uh, I've, I've, I've been uh, I've been following the the, the teaching of of, of different. Uh, uh, senseis, always uh, Ki Aikido senseis, but different senseis. Uh, also, uh, the experience of uh, of, of uh, following Aikido in Japan and following Aikido in, in Europe, and, and sometimes uh, a bit like uh, Udo Shil sensei was, uh, was explaining last time, uh, being surprised uh, in Europe by the, the, the fact that, uh, or in the Western world, I would say, uh, be, uh, seeing that people are surprised by the etiquette and and, and surprised by uh, by things that are very ordinary uh, back in Japan and and, and very trivial and very uh, uh, ju just just normal, uh, whereas in Europe uh, uh, people need sometimes long speeches <laughs> to to, uh, to 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 understand uh, very basic stuff uh, in terms of 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 the etiquette. Uh, at least, um, uh, there, there could be many other things to be said, but uh, I think for, for, for now it's enough. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Christophe. And Lillian, did you have something? Okay, so Lillian from Hawaii. Uh, I too have a small dojo and I became head instructor by circumstances, not by choice. Never wanted to be a teacher, never expected to be a teacher. Um, but it turned out to be one of the best things that could have happened. It made me a much better student. And I look at every student that comes through my door because mostly I have young students, young kids and young adults. And everybody to me is a potential instructor and hopefully someone to take my place one day. And um, we also have a unique circumstance at our dojo that we share the dojo with a judo club. We own the dojo, but it's on a church property. And once either the judo club or the Aikido club disappears, the church gets the building back. But until then, it's ours. So I'm very interested in making sure I do have someone to follow behind me. Great, thank you. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> teaching is one thing, that's a whole different subject, but finding and having, a, having a, uh, a developmental program, I think is something everyone should be thinking about that has a dojo. Uh, I know uh, Suzuki Sensei, you know, he, you know he, he grew up in a time when Aikido was very, very new. And of course, being, you know, in Hawaii, uh, and then going to Japan and training with Toy Sensei, you know, it was a, such a unique experience. And, and many people, you know, don't realize that, 
that, that experience can never happen again, ever. You know, it just, it just will never, ever happen. And, and everyone needs to find their own experience and path. And, and doing it through a program, you know, a structured program is always good. But, uh, you know, lest we forget there are dojos that, that may not have a structured program. And, and you have to develop it. You, you have to do your own thing sometimes, you know. Uh, and, and the one thing that will, and I, and I said this earlier, the one thing will hurt any uh, developmental program is, is competition. And, and, and you don't realize that, but, but, but competition, it just breeds, you know, um, uh, it just negativity. You know, when, when you, you know, Curtis, Curtis Sensei has, a, and he, he talks about it on this podcast, the scroll that's in his room. And I, I'll never forget, you know, when he first told, actually it was, it was uh, Suzuki Sensei who told me about the scroll. He, he had two of them made. Uh, Lee, I'm not sure what the other one said, but it's the Masa, Masagatsu Kayatsu Kachi Hayabi that, that Curtis Sensei talks about on the Maui uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and I remember when, when he was telling us about this, and was that a seminar? And you know me, uh, when it comes to somebody saying something that they got, I want to see it. Okay, so there's a party at Curtis Sensei's house. And not the house he currently lives in now. It was a house before that in Haiku. Had a nice swimming pool. It's a two-story house. I remember that. And we're at this party, and, and it was 1997, right around that time. And Curtis Sensei's over to the side. I say, oh, Sensei, I said, uh, you know, uh, you, you mentioned uh, that you have a scroll by oh, Sensei. He went, oh, yeah. Can I see it? He's like, oh, yeah, sure, come with me. And he took me upstairs to his meditation room. He had a meditation room set up, and the meditation room had a little, you know, uh, altar, but it was just, a, you know, like a little table. And it had uh, a little cup of water, a picture of Yamaoka Teshu, and uh, the, the scroll. And I was just like, you know, and at that time he had a Seiza bench because he sat Seiza and I was in a, in a, a, a Zafu. And uh, I was just like, wow, this is really interesting. It was so, it just motivated me to, it, it inspired me to create a little space, which I did in my closet in Arizona to meditate in. It's like a little box, you know, but I, but I developed my own little system because I thought that was so important to do. Um, you know, and, and, you know, we know what it says, you know, true victory uh, you know, over oneself, you know, uh, you know, he likes to say, you know, let the other person win because uh, when you're last, you're actually first. I'm just paraphrasing here. Uh, and, and what that tells you is, you know, it's let by letting another person take the honor versus you leaving yourself out. Yeah, that's okay. You know, we live in a society today that's 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 basically we're bombarded with social media. You know, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. You know, it's it's out there, and and maybe you're of an age where you're not familiar with it. But let me tell you what talk to anybody in your kids talk to your kids in your classes and they know all about that stuff because they they're into that and and that just you know it's a very useful tool you have to think of it as a tool it's it's people tend to run their lives by it and you have to think about that you know uh i remember you know and this you know it's a tool like anything and and it's kind of like it reminds me of a story that you know that Curtis Sensei goes into Suzuki Sensei's office and says, yeah, uh, Sensei, uh, we have to start advertising. We need to put an advertisement in the phone book. Suzuki Sensei went, what? Why do we want to do that? Well, uh, Sensei, uh, we'll, we'll get more students. Really? No, no, no. When the student is ready, they will come. 
And that was his whole, that was like the philosophy back then is when the students ready to train, they show up at the dojo. But, you know, it took a lot. Curtis Sensei finally was able <laughs> to put an ad in the phone book in the yellow pages to advertise Mali Yaido. And, and, you know, that was, that was just his way of trying to reach out. And we all have different methods of reaching out and that's a whole different class. But, you know, getting back to uh, letting other people win, letting other people have the glory, you setting back. And, and it's something that, you know, you really have to think about and, and ask yourself, oh, why am I teaching? Why? Why do I want to be out there in front? Why do I want to do this? And, and I always start off a lot of my beginner classes with a, a tool that I tell them to, to do. And, 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 and that is, you know, I ask them why they're here at the dojo. When we have an intro class, I go, why are you here? And they'll give me a reason. I'll say, why about that? And I asked them why five times because that's just something to me. I actually learned that. That's, that actually came from, I think his name was Seichi Toyota. And that was his way back in the 1930s to do uh, quality assurance. He called it the five whys. You ask why five times and then you'll get to the root of the issue or the reason you want to do something. Five times. And I asked Every beginner class I've ever had, I ask them why they're doing Aikido. Why are you here? And I ask them five times, why, why, why? And they'll get to the bottom of it one way or another. But, you know, that tool is, 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 is useful, but we don't want to get stuck on it, of course. And, and we have to realize that, you know, the, if we don't study the past and what happened, and you see what happened in the past, you know, the awful competition that happened and the Aikikai that basically drove Toy Sensei out on his own, as well as what really happened in the key society throughout the ages of people competing, you know, with instructors competing with one another. It's not about that. And it all starts with teacher development. You know, develop your teachers not to compete, you know, and first that has to start with you. You have to be the one to let the other person win, and, and then you can move forward. And, and what people think, oh, well, that'll hold me back. But actually what that does is it frees you up. And uh, I'd like to close with a little story, and <clears throat> you've probably heard this one, or you may have heard this one. There's a lot of translations to, you know, you have to understand that when something is translated into English, either it be from Japanese or Chinese, it can be translated either literally or poetically. And, and I don't know which this is, but it's called The Empty Boat by Chung Su. And it was translated by Thomas Mer Merton, who, who was a Benedict, a Benedict monk that lived in Vietnam. Um, if a man is crossing a river, and an empty boat collides with his own skiff, even though he be a bad-tempered man, he will not become very angry. But if he sees a man in the boat, he will shout at him to steer clear. If the shout is not heard, he will shout again and yet again and begin cursing. And all because there is somebody in the boat. Yet, if the boat were empty, he would not be shouting and not be angry. If you can empty your own boat crossing the river of the world, no one will oppose you, no one will seek to harm you. Who can free himself from achievement and from fame and descend and be lost amid the masses of men? He will flow like the Tao, unseen. He will go about life like itself with no name and no home. Simple is he, Without distinction, to all appearances, he is a fool. His steps leave no trace. He has no power. He achieves nothing, has no reputation. Since he judges no one, no one judges him. Such is the perfect man. His boat is empty. And with that, thank you all for coming. And I'll see you next week. I know on Maui here, we're, we're in for another month. So we'll probably do this through May.
And with that, thank you all very much. Tomo arigato gozaimasu. Mm -hmm.